This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. From Microbe TV, this is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 141, recorded on December 8th, 2016. This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service that offers over 1,500 documentaries and nonfiction series from the world's best filmmakers. Get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. And for our audience, the first two months are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the promo code MICROBE. The show is sponsored by Drobo, a family of safe, expandable, yet simple-to-use storage arrays. Drobos are designed to protect your important data forever. This holiday season, give someone a Drobo to keep all their files and memories safe forever. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Well, hello there. How are you? It's been a couple of weeks. We we skipped the Thanksgiving episode. Aha, uh-huh, it's true. It's been a while. Have you been well? Everything good out there on yes, the West thank Coast? Yes, all is well. That's great. And winter must be setting in, I'm sure. Have you had snow? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. You don't do that. What's in that? <laughs> What's that? How do you spell that? Also joining us from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. How have you been? I've been well, and we missed TWIM number 140, though I'm going to do a shameless plug for our listeners. Vincent's probably too modest to talk about it, but it's a fantastic episode. If you haven't caught up, listen to TWIM 140. Vincent was on an away game, <laughs> and he he left the team behind, but he was out in beautiful Montana. And I won't spoil it, no spoiler alerts, but just go ahead and listen to it. And as many of us after the election were a little bit disappointed with our future, when you listen to this twim, you'll be impressed that there is going to be a future. (laughs) Thank you, Michael. It was a lot of fun. I had a good trip. Have you ever been to Hamilton, Montana? No, it's one of the states I haven't been to. Montana is like one of three that I haven't been to. Well, while I was there, not only did I record that twim, but I also recorded another twim with Robert Heinsohn, who works on Coxiella Bernetti, and I'll air that at some point in the future. And I also did a twib, um, so I have some content coming forward. And that twim 140, by the way, there's video, so if you want to look at it, check oh, it out. Okay, it's fun. We have a guest today joining us. Michelle isn't here, but we have a guest who is a professor out at the University of Pittsburgh, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Jennifer Baumberger, welcome to TWIM. Thank you so much. I, I'm excited to be here and looking forward to the show. So I first met you back in January when I visited Pitt. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was on the occasion of the Julius Youngner lecture. Correct. It was. We taped a TWIV that time. That's right. It was a TWIV, which is appropriate for Julie, right? Because he spent most of his mm-hmm. life doing virus work. And um, that was the weekend of the big storm in the Northeast. Now, <laughs> it took, as I've told many times on Twiv and Twim, how long it took me to get home. But I understand you've changed now the the timing of that lecture to make it in a better weather season. We have. We <laughs> learned a lesson from your visit, Vincent. <laughs> That's we're now great. doing it in June this year. So we're wrapping up our annual seminar series with the Youngner Lecture this year. So Paul Offit's going to join us this year. So that's very exciting. Oh, that'll be great. He's wonderful. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm glad you learned something from me. Something good came out of my visit. <laughs> we learned lots of things, but scheduling was one of them. <laughs> well, I met you out there. We had a chat in the in your office, and uh, I thought it would be nice to have you on TWIM one day. So here we are. Uh, yeah, ten, ten, ten months later, we finally got the scheduling to work, and we thought we'd uh, talk a little bit about some of your recent work. What I found interesting is that you work on co-infections of viruses and bacteria. So this is kind of a crossover episode, right? Mm-hmm. It could be mm-hmm. TWIV or it could be uh, TWIM. <laughs> you you could get, get double duty it. out of it. <laughs> you just list them as the same number. Post them in both. Uh, yeah. Part. That would be sneaky because we do have a lot of people who listen to many of our podcasts and they would probably cry foul. I would oh. Guess. <laughs> I don't, don't want to do that to them. But um but Jennifer, you're not a virologist, right? You're a microbiologist, I would say. 
Uh, microbiologist, or actually, I'm trained in epithelial cell biology, so I'm a cell oh, biologist. You're a cell biologist. Training, so so I'm, I'm, tell us a little bit about your history. Where are you from originally? So I'm from York, Pennsylvania is where I grew up, so about mm, three hours ooh. from here in Pittsburgh, so just north of Baltimore. You know, it's interesting. Many scientists end up close to where they were brought up. You know, I always ask cool. people, that, yeah, I think so. Except you, okay. Elio. Except you. You and I are the exceptions to the rule, Elio. Yeah, but there are many people who end up uh, very close. Now, Elio, you were born in Italy, right? That's right, in Milan. I'm Milan. not living near Milan. <laughs> no, you're not near Milan. What about you, Michael? Where were you born? Chicago. Yeah, but you went there a lot. I grew up there. <laughs> you know, even in the past few years, you went there. Visit your dad, if you remember. <laughs> yeah, I'm... Yeah, I would have to go home and visit family. So, Jennifer, you were born and raised. You went to high school in New York? Yes, I did. Where'd you go to college? I went to college for undergrad. I went to Penn State University. I'm a Nittany Lion. Oh, my gosh. Now, I bet you went to grad school in Pennsylvania, too, right? No, I went to Michigan for graduate <laughs> school, to Michigan State University for graduate school. Okay. Now, now at Penn, uh, were you a science major? Uh, yes, I was a microbiology Penn State. major. Penn State. Penn State. So, so when you say pen, that means you pen, is that right? That's yeah. how most people take it. Yeah. Uh, so I have to it's say, my alma mater, so I better stand up for it. You pen is yours. <laughs> pen is yeah. your. Oh, wow. I'm my PhD there. Wow, I'm, I'm not sure I remembered that, but that's great. So you were a microbiology major. At... So was a microbiology major for undergraduate. That's unusual, right? Um, I don't th- you mean to make the big switch from no, no, but that that, the, that there is a micro undergraduate major. I don't think every school like we don't have a microbiology major here at Columbia at the yeah, I'm not sure because exactly you're a, only a limited Ivy League school. <laughs> only limited. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> it was a lot of pre meds. Took microbiology at um mm-hmm. at, at Penn State when I was there, but I did my undergrad in microbiology and uh-huh. then decided I wanted to learn more about. The, the human host of these infections that I was learning about. And so my PhD is in physiology then, that human physiology. M- Michigan State, right? Yes, yes. Not, not too far from Michelle Swanson. Nope, not too far from Michelle Swanson. Uh, now, now um, we've been to, I have been to Penn State a couple of times because we've had an American Society for Virology meeting there. Mm-hmm. And last summer there was a, a human virome meeting there as well. And for me, it's four hours from my house, so I can go there uh, anytime. It's a lovely campus. It's really nice. Yeah. Very pretty. Mm -hmm. Now, were you interested in science all your life or is it something you found in college? Um, I guess I I read The Hot Zone and fell in love with microbiology. (laughs) I think like many people of my generation, maybe. And then it's true. um, Really enjoyed microbiology in um, undergraduate. And um, I went to a pharmaceutical and did some work there during my undergraduate degree, which Mm -hmm. is another reason I worked at SmithKline Beecham, which is now GlaxoSmithKline. And um, I did a cooperative research experience there, which also made me realize I needed to learn more about the host. And that was part of the reason I did the physiology degree. Mm-hmm. But um, I think my, I really solidified my love of science in undergrad or coming out of high school, I guess. Mm-hmm. So after your PhD at Michigan State, I presume you did a postdoc, right? Yep. I did a postdoc at um, Dartmouth mm-hmm. uh, Medical. And when I was there, I worked with uh, in Bruce Stanton's lab, mm-hmm. and uh, I moved there. My PhD was in um, protein trafficking and um, in renal proximal tubule cells, actually, so in a polarized epithelial cell. And I wanted to keep on learning about protein trafficking, but I wanted to do it in a disease-relevant model. And so cystic fibrosis mm-hmm. is a really good model for a misfolded, mistrafficked protein. And so that's how I ended up at Dartmouth in Bruce Stanton's lab. And mm-hmm. Right when I arrived there, we had started a collaboration with George O'Toole, who's a um, Pseudomonas ruginosa microbiologist. And um, that collaboration led to um, a protein that Pseudomonas made that changed protein trafficking in the epithelial cells. And so that was kind of a natural project for me and turned out to be a really fun collaboration between the two labs. Mm. So with two great mentors for my, for my postdoc. Yeah. Now you. Sure. This is at the medical school of Dartmouth. Is that right? Yes. Yes. So it was in the my mentors in the microbiology and immunology department, and so uh, and so was George. So. So who's the legendary professor there? Is that Elmer Pfefferkorn? Is that his name? Yes. Toxoplasma gondii. Did you ever meet him or talk with him? He would come to seminars occasionally, and so we interacted a little bit, but um, not as much. It would have been fun to have more interaction with him, but he was um, emeritus at that point. Yeah. Yeah, I've read a lot about him, how he was such a terrific lecturer and he worked 
every year he would work on his lectures over and over and over again, his medical school lectures, I guess. The medical students adore him there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's pretty neat. So after your postdoc, uh, did you go right to Pitt? Yep, I moved right to Pitt. So I did one long postdoc and then I moved to Pitt in 2011. So I've been here five years now. So you're relatively uh, a relatively new professor there, right? Correct. You're probably yep. you're probably coming up on tenure in a couple of years, right? I just submitted everything, actually. Oh. So my, my letters have been submitted, I've heard. So I'm in the middle of the process. Well, now that you're on TWIM, it, it's a given. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. Thank you. But, uh, um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about what you're, what you're doing there. You published a paper earlier this year in PNAS called Respiratory Syncytial Virus Infection Enhances Pseudomonas Aeruginosa Biofilm Growth Through Dysregulation of Nutritional Immunity. <laughs> I like that term, yeah. nutritional immunity. And, you know, here on TWIM, we have talked about that before. We talk about the battle for iron. Mm-hmm. And the, That's where we're going to end up today, too. And the, and the recent one was the battle for oxygen. Would that fall into nutritional immunity too? Mm, only if you think about what iron is used for. Yeah. Yeah. Well, why, why not? I don't know. It's well, another. It's kind of the same idea that the host is tricked into giving up iron in some way. And mm-hmm. in the last, you know, a couple of twins ago, we talked about a paper where a gut organism, I think it was Salmonella, you know, tricks epithelial cells in the gut to uh, undergo fermentation, and that frees up oxygen for the bacterium to use. I don't know if you saw that paper, uh, Jen. It was from Andreas Baumler's lab. It's very oh, I've cool. not, I have not seen that paper. He very, does lovely work. Though. Very cool stuff. But uh, same idea that the, somehow the a limiting factor, whether it be iron or oxygen, is tricked into being released. How did you get into this, this area of co-infections? Yeah, so I, the, I guess the way we got into it was thinking about in cystic fibrosis, how chronic infections get established in patients. And we were reading a bunch of the literature, trying to think about this as I was starting to gear up to move and start my independent research program. And we kept seeing there's an abundance of literature in cystic fibrosis that when patients um, get chronically infected with Pseudomonas aeruginosa, so this is an infection they get in the um, their late teens or early 20s, and it's thought that this infection leads to the majority of their morbidity and mortality in patients, which is why we were so interested in the establishment of these chronic infections. But if you look through the literature of when patients get chronically infected, it cor- there's a lot of clinical literature that they've had a respiratory viral infection around the same time. It um, Um, Their chronic pseudomonas acquisition tends to happen in the winter months, which is also respiratory virus season. So there's all this clinical literature. And if you talk to physicians, they'll say that virus infections seem to have some correlation with um, chronic pseudomonas infections in patients. So we became really interested in if we could understand maybe mechanistically how that's happening and with the long-term goal of trying to prevent it. Remind us um, what's going on in cystic fibrosis in, in the patient. Yep. So, um, in cystic fibrosis, so cystic fibrosis is caused by genetic uh, mutations in the CFTR or cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator. It's a chloride channel in the. Um, it's expressed in many cell types in the body. One of the places it seems to have a really important function is in your airway epithelium in your lungs, and they're conducting chloride ions into the airway surface liquids. Important in maintaining fluid balance on the airway epithelium that allows you to have effective mucosillary clearance. And so so when you have a defective chloride channel by a number, there's thousands of mutations that will cause cystic fibrosis. And um, those mutations cause either an inappropriate trafficking of CFTR to the membrane of the epithelium where it needs to work, or it doesn't gate properly once it gets there. Mm-hmm. But it ends up, you get a dehydrated airway surface liquid, you get thick and sticky mucus, and that ends up um, preventing mucosillary clearance and you get pathogens and debris in the airway. And so that tends to lead to many infections in patients, but for reasons we still don't fully understand by the time they reach their late teens or early 20s, Pseudomonas aeruginosa tends to dominate the airways of these Mm. patients. Mm. So you decided, based on the literature, you wanted to look into a viral trigger. Right. Correct. And so that's where this paper, I assume, originated. And you settled on respiratory syncytial virus, right? Yes. Yeah, so may, may I pipe in with yeah. something a little bit off, offbeat? Sure, sure. Uh, Jennifer, you're probably aware of the work from uh, Forest Rohr's lab where they find mm-hmm. phages bind to mucus in the lung 
it may be a protective mechanism against bacterial infection. Mm. So I'm I'm just uh, I'm standing up for viruses, not necessarily being bad things. They can be good things too. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, maybe because the mucus is so thick, the phages can't get where they need to go and protect. Right? But that's also sure. But but the viruses stick to mucus. They have yeah. a, a specific receptor too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they then the idea is that they would prevent infections by lysing bacterial hosts, right? There are certainly phage therapies in development too. Mm -hmm. For for cystic fibrosis? For many different bacteria, for pseudomonas infections in general. But in CF, they have cystic fibrosis, they have started to look at phage therapies. Mm. So I know that early on people tried to do gene therapy for CF, right? Is that not going anywhere either? I know this is off the track, but... Um, that's being revisited now that there's new, um, I mean, people are talking about CRISPR-Cas, they're, yeah, they're talking yeah. about new um, viral vectors that would be more effective. Part of the problem with using gene delivery of CFTR into epithelial cells is really the ability to deliver the gene effectively into the epithelium. epithelium epithelial cells are pretty good at preventing any DNA or RNA to be delivered into them because it's mm. kind of you know, for native immune response, that's part of their reason for being is, is detecting this and not allowing expression. So that's been tricky to find the right vectors that can actually yeah. um, get these genes expressed. And so there's still debate in the field even of how much CFTR you need to get effective um, mucosillary clearance, enough chloride secretion and mucosillary clearance. And so some of those are things we're still trying to figure out in the field. I, I assume also the turnover of the epithelium is an issue, right? Correct. Because it does turn over. I don't know if it is it as much as the gut or is it still enough to prevent effective gene therapy probably, right? It's not as much as the gut, but it still would be some it's some sort of barrier when you're trying to think of gene therapy. Yeah, yeah. So how did you mm. how did you focus on respiratory syncytial virus? Yeah, so we went to the literature when this was when we were starting these studies and there were kind of three major viruses, which is still what we see in cystic fibrosis patients in the lungs at least, and that's um, patients get rhinovirus infections, they get influenza infections and respiratory syncytial virus. And mm. so part of the reason we chose respiratory syncytial virus was there was also some literature out there that patients will also have subclinical levels of respiratory syncytial virus infection, even when they're not showing clinical symptoms. And so potentially for this virus, it may be around even when patients aren't showing symptoms and may lead to more chronic changes in the epithelium to support infection. So that was one of the reasons. And the second reason was completely technical of um, that respiratory syncytial virus is a little easier on our airway epithelial cells and allows us to do some of our assays easier. So some of that was purely technical. Doesn't kill them, right? Yes. Yeah, that's important because if it did, that would be kind of Difficult. Many of your figures would go away then. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Yes. Yes. We did a, a, a ton of control experiments to convince ourselves that our epithelial cells were healthy in our assays and actually were modeling what happens in cystic right. fibrosis. So take us through the paper first. Tell us what the system is that you use. Yeah, so we've developed a system. Um, I developed this when I was in Bruce Stanton's lab working with George O'Toole at Dartmouth, and I moved this model with me to the University of Pittsburgh, where we grow um, human airway epithelial cells um, polarized. And so we can grow them either from cell lines or we can use, now that I'm here at Pittsburgh, we have a robust transplant program, so we can use primary cells from patients as well. So we grow airway epithelial cells at air-liquid interface, which causes them to um, fully polarize. And there we can inoculate bacteria into them and with perfusion, so with live cell imaging, which some of the figures in the paper are going to show. And then also we have plate-based methods where we can watch um, biofilm development of the bacteria into this chronic biofilm mode of growth over time. And so we do, we've done um, in the past gene expression and morphology and antibiotic resistance studies to convince ourselves that these are actually growing as a biofilm in our model system. So you have these in, a, in some kind of chamber that you can look at on a microscope, yep. right? Yep. So we have like a imaging. terrific system, really. Quite it's nice. been really nice. So we can watch dynamic changes with imaging and then um, the imaging's lower throughput so we can use our plate-based assays to look at bacterial mutants or um, manipulate the epithelial cells with siRNA and things mm-hmm. like that. So if you just so what's the effect of RSV on this system? 
Yep. So when we went in and started the assays, we found that if we pretreated epithelial cells with respiratory syncytial virus to mimic a preceding viral infection, which is seen more cl- more commonly in, in patients, we see a robust biofilm growth on airway epithelial cells, much greater than the control, probably about 10 times the control. Mm. And so, um, so this was very exciting. Biofilms are te- thought to be how Pseudomonas is growing when it transitions to a biofilm mode of gro- or to a chronic infection in cystic fibrosis. So it was important to see this transition happen. Mm-hmm. So that was the exciting first figure that kind of started this project. So if you, you, you pre-infect with RSV, and then how much later do you come in with Pseudomonas? So we come in with Pseudomonas. Um, we've done time courses, but the peak seems to be 72 hours after infection. Mm. And um, as we're going to get into later on, that's when we also see the peak of an innate immune response initiated mm. in polarized cells. So we think that's correlated. Can you... Can you infect after you add pseudomonas and have an effect, or, or is there some time after which it doesn't work anymore? So um, we would love to do those experiments. That, again, is a technically limited. Pseudomonas is pretty um, pretty hard on our airway epithelial cells, uh, and so we it's a, normally a 6 to 12-hour assay that we're doing for imaging, and the viral infection would take much longer to get up and running. And so until we come up with a new model system to be able to grow our epithelial cells, I think we're kind of restricted in the time we can do the assays. Right. So I notice in these uh, initial assays, you're measuring pseudomonas by colony forming units. So you're actually Correct. plating that out, right? Mm-hmm. In virus, you're doing PCR for viral RNA? We're doing RNA. PCR, but we've also done plaque assays. So it I does, it does grow. Shown, yes, it does, it does grow. Yeah, that's so it makes important. RNA and makes virus, infectious yeah, virus. Yeah, that's important. Because yeah, really. if you didn't look for infectious virus, unfortunately in some, in some of the Zika literature, people are not looking for infectious virus and they're just looking for RNA and you never know what's going on there. Correct. Sure. But here... Yeah. But here, okay, so you had this cool effect. What did you do next? Yeah, so what we wanted to know next, I mean, so first in the first figure, we also looked at um, confirming some things that are important to check when you're doing these in vitro systems. We wanted to also convince ourselves. So we used uh, lab strain was the initial, the lab strain of Pseudomonas ruginosa was our initial finding. We confirmed that we can use clinical isolates from cystic fibrosis. That's often, sometimes you'll see differences in lab strains to clinical isolates. So uh, we've shown that we can see, we see the same thing with clinical isolates. And if we take primary cells from CF patients or cell lines, we see the same phenotype in all of those. So those were important controls Mm -hmm. to do. Then we moved on to ask how this was actually happening. And one way we decided to go after that was to look and see, can we use different viruses? Is is this an RSV specific thing or is this something that other respiratory viruses will induce? And to ask that question, we used um, human rhinovirus 14 and adenovirus 5 as two very different viruses in RSV. And so when we did that, we infected our cells. We saw replication and um, affected viral replication in our cells. And then when we did the bio, the biofilm assay, we saw that those viruses also induced biofilm growth. Mm. So that suggested to us two very different RNA viruses and a DNA virus. That suggested to us that this probably wasn't a viral effector protein. It was more likely something more general like the host immune response to viruses. Mm. That's and very so, clever, really. I like that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's a good one because uh, if you just did one virus, you wouldn't know. So you're. Well, th- it also has implications as as you begin to go downstream and to begin to think about how to combat a pseudomonas biofilm. Is you don't necessarily want a viral infection, and you really want to deliver the immune response directly against the virus at the particular cell you're trying to infect. And so rather than vaccinating and getting IgG, you'll want to be able to ensure that you get um, IgA being secreted from uh, the airway cells. Mm, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So Jennifer, is this effect of virus on biofilm development, does it require a polarized cell monolayer or can you do it in other non-polarized cells? Yeah, so we've actually done these studies. Um, we're going to get a little further on in the paper where we see this condition media effect. We actually see that in um, non-polarized cells. 
But um, when they're polarized, we are certainly seeing the secreted factor that stimulates biofilms that we'll talk mm-hmm. about in a, in a little bit. That is a polarized secretion that's secreted only apically and not basolaterally. And so um, we think in terms of we can do this in an unpolarized cell system, and we've done that for some screening mm-hmm. projects mm-hmm. that we have going on. But we think in terms of understanding better what's happening mechanistically, the polarized model is probably the better model to use. Okay, so you have this effect with several viruses, so you're thinking it's a cell response. Correct. Now, how did your thinking work? What did you think of next? Did you immediately go to what's in the paper, or did you try some other things? <laughs> No, so we actually tried a bunch of things. And so some of this is um, the story of being a new faculty that I was still getting my virus preps up and running when I had just joined the department. And I decided a better way to go after that would be, or while we're getting the viral infection part up and running, we would read the literature, any um, any PAMPs, any pattern patterns that will induce a um, innate immune response that have been shown to be important for RSV will will buy synthetic inducers of all of those systems mm-hmm. and add those to our airway cells and see which of those are actually important in generating this biofilm stimulatory effect. And so there's literature that TLR3, TLR4, RIGI, all these different pattern recognition receptors in the host that are important. We bought ligands for all of them and tested them all. And so what we found with that was anything that fed into the interferon pathway gave us our stimulation Mm -hmm. and anything that didn't did not give us stimulation. And so those those studies didn't actually make the paper, but um, we decided to just show the interferon data in the paper. Yeah, but that's how we actually did the study. As always a backstory, right? Yes. (laughs) It was actually nice how clean it was, though. That that always isn't always the case. Yeah. Yeah. So what what what's the experiment that showed you it was interferon? Yep. So the next, so um, when we had those preliminary studies suggesting it was interferon, we um, infected our airway epithelial cells first with um, respiratory syncytial virus and just measured and made sure both type 1 and type 3 interferon. So interferon lambda and interferon beta, we wanted to see if they were actually getting induced in our airway cells and both are induced in our airway epithelial cells. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so we used um, mRNA and then ELISA to show that they get induced. And then we took exogenous or recombinant protein for the same amount that our airway cells were making and added that directly to our airway cells in the absence of a viral infection. And the point of that was to see if we can induce the immune response without a virus infection, that should tell us whether or not it's actually the host immune response and not the virus infection um, itself or a viral effector protein that was inducing our phenotype. And so when we added interferon lambda or interferon beta to our airway cells, it induces biofilm growth mm-hmm. as well. Mm. That's, that's nice. So then the next step, we just did a bunch of control. Then we knocked down the receptor. We used neutralizing antibodies, a bunch of ways to convince ourselves that it was actually signaling through the receptor was important for this phenotype. Mm. And it was. So both uh, lambda and type 1 interferons work? Correct. Mm. Correct. And both of these are induced by respiratory syncytial virus infection, right? Yes. Mm. Yes. Mm. Okay. So. Yep. And, we, and then we added interferon as well directly to the bacteria to make sure that we didn't have any phenotype. We also did that with RSV that I didn't mention to show that there was not any direct phenotype of either the interferon or the virus on the bacteria alone. We needed the host cells there. Right. Let me ask you, does, does anybody really understand interferon? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Julie Julie Youngner does. <laughs> <laughs> he seems so contradictory in a way, you know. It's a sort of strange response by the body. Yeah. It definitely is interesting that we have different signaling for, I mean, I think there's different temporal regulation of these two interferons, but it is interesting. They both signal very similarly, induce a f- similar set of, of downstream genes. And so um, I think... There are certainly still questions in the field of how that signaling works and why we have multiple mechanisms to induce a similar response. Well, interference is paradoxical, right? It's it's protective, but it also hurts you. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. That's right. That's mm-hmm. what I mean. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, if you give people interferon for therapy, they're miserable, which is what we did for years for hepatitis C. Um, mm-hmm. It's toxic. And so it's got to be highly regulated. You know, it has to be produced in a burst uh, after infection. And as we'll see, it can have negative consequences as well. So yeah, it's a double-edged sword, I would say. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I met John Lindemann, who was the co-discoverer yeah, right. with Isaacs of Interferon. And I got to say, he didn't seem to be more <laughs> clear about some of these contradictory aspects of Interferon than we are. Now, we're, we're learning the details for sure. 
Yeah. But um, we also learn how uh, it, it's uh, it's good and bad for sure. Well, fundamentally, I think it's because the cells have the ability to produce it in bursts, while the pharmaceutical industry wants to deliver it. Yeah, as a, that's true. <laughs> and it delivers it in a burst at the location it's actually needed to combat the virus yeah. as opposed to delivering it systemically. Yeah, there was always, some way right. to deliver it non in a systemic manner that would only target the cell that is infected with the virus, then that would be ideal. And I think that's the fundamental challenge with interferon. Sure. Yeah, that's a great point. Jen, does, does Pseudomonas alone induce any interferon in these um, cell monolayers? It will eventually induce interferon, inter- uh-huh. type 1 interferon. So Alice Prince has shown that. Okay, but it's not enough to, in a mouse model. Not enough to get this effect that you're looking at, right? Is that true for not, other bacterial infections? I wasn't aware of that. Yes, other bacteria will induce, um, will also huh. induce um, type one interferon response. But it, they inter- they at least for our studies, it induces it at a time period that it takes much longer to induce it. And so, in the, our six hour window, um, Pseudomonas, at least in our studies, would not be inducing it, but it could potentially be inducing um, different host changes over time in the lung, in a long-term infection. I see. And it's also dependent upon the phase of the growth of the microbe itself, because if it's growing as a planktonic cell extracellularly from the, the, what will happen is the microbe will literally just consume the local area through its normal infection. If the organism becomes internalized, then you have the type 3 secretion opera going on where the organism is hiding from the uh, Mm. cell itself. And it's that type 3 secretion opera that is going on that is organism-dependent and pathogenicity island-dependent that really drives some of the fascinating biology that people are working on. Oh, interesting. So the next part of the story involves iron. And how did you get onto that, Jen? Yeah, so um, so part of this was we did some work during my postdoc looking at the requirement of iron for Pseudomonas biofilm formation. And so this had been published for many years. Pradeep Singh and, and Pete Greenberg showed that Pseudomonas biofilms in an abiotic surface, like on plastic, required iron. And that had been known for a while. And we confirmed that iron was also important for the phenotype of biofilms growing on the host epithelium. And so... Um, that nutrient became a, a quick question for us as a potential um, mechanism for how this was actually happening, that potentially the virus infection was changing some nutrient that Pseudomonas needed. Once we showed that conditioned media, so we didn't need the airway cells, we just needed what they had secreted during those three days of, of the viral infection, we had to start thinking about secreted factors, and we thought of iron right away for that. How do you measure iron in uh, these, the, the, the conditioned medium? Yeah, so we use a a plate-based assay that's a colorimetric assay for iron. And then we also confirm our studies with ICP mass spectrometry, which is much more sensitive and a a better way to analyze. Yeah, and more expensive, too. (laughs) Much more expensive, and and we can't do it ourselves, so we we have to send samples out. So we use the plate-based assay for the day-to-day measurements. So what did you find? So what we found was that, um, so first, if we looked that RSV infection was actually inducing release of iron into the um, apical, we were calling it apical condition media, but in the host, it would be, in an actual lung, it would be the airway surface liquid, basically. Mm -hmm. So we saw an increase in iron there, and if we chelated that iron, um, Pseudomonas will no longer form biofilms. And so that suggested to us that iron was a key part of our, a key factor in this biofilm induction. So is the the iron release dependent on interferon production? I I guess it is because you need interferon for this effect, right? Yes. Yep. So do you, yes, it requires, yep. So do do you understand what, how that's happening? How is interferon leading to the release of iron? No, that part we don't understand yet. And so um, in the paper, we show that the iron release is, is mediated by transferrin. Uh, we think so. Iron's bound to transferrin and iron binding protein, but we don't fully understand yet how um, interferon signaling is actually changing that. And so we have some some studies underway, some screening approaches that we're doing to look at iron, interferon stimulated genes to mm-hmm. actually see which of those is inducing this change of um, trafficking of transferrin and its release to try to get a better handle on that. So transferrin is present where in the cell on the surface? 
So t- transferrin is actually um, in the inside the cell, mm-hmm. and we also, because of so, I should probably explain a little bit better. When we grow these polarized human airway epithelial cells, they're actually growing on a permeable membrane support. So it's a um, like a dish that has the airway cells growing in it. There's air on the top on the apical side of the cells and beneath the cells is the tissue culture dish and that has growth media in it. Mm -hmm. And so that growth media has transferrin in it, holotransferrin. So that's where pseudomonas or where where the cells can actually get the iron bound transferrin. So when you, when you infect them with RSV, you see an increase in transferrin, right? We see an increase in transferrin, not in the cells itself, but in that apical Um, conditioned media or what would be the airway surface liquid. And so we see it end up in the compartment where the bacteria actually are, where they can access it. So the initial experiment was to just look and see all iron transporters and iron binding proteins in the host cell, do those protein expression levels actually Mm. or protein abundance change during virus infection? And we were surprised to see, we didn't really see any dramatic changes in that. And so that made us take a step back, and that's when we actually saw it was actually it's secretion. The secretion of um, transferrin is what's different during virus infection, and only apically. It only gets secreted apically. So it's coming out of the cell apically. Mm-hmm. Yep. And somehow that's a, that's an effect of interferon, right? Somehow, yes. So but we don't understand. Yeah. It's probably trying to starve the virus for iron. Yes. I, I think our thought is moving forward that 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 host response of secreting the transferrin to the apical compartment is probably is probably the correct response, but that that I, the transferrin that's being released during the virus infection is actually bound to iron, and um, that's probably not an appropriate response. But that that has to do with changes in the endosomes during virus infection that they um, we see a block of acidification of the endosomes. This we did not publish in the paper, but the endosomes no longer acidify is the hypothesis because RSV requires that acidification for its replication. And so what we're hypothesizing is the transferrin is not ending up in an acidic compartment, so it's maintaining iron bound to transferrin where it shouldn't be, and then it gets released apically. And that's how the bacteria can access the iron. Uh, so normally transferrin would be released without iron because the iron would Correct. be left behind in the cell, right? Mm-hmm. It would go out mm-hmm. and grab some more iron and then come back in again, come right? Come back in, yep. yep. So this is odd, as you say, because it's being released with iron. Yeah, something's Correct. wrong there. Uh, and the pseudomonas is taking advantage of it because it's iron limited. And Absolutely. so it's it's going, my goodness, a gift. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's yeah, a gift sure from the virus. <laughs> Christmas came early. Yeah. How does the... So I assume that iron is down, is bound pretty tightly to transferrin. How does Sunomotus rip it out of there? It's ten to the minus fifty two. <laughs> That's its binding kinetic. <laughs> really? Yeah. Wow. You, you carry that number in your head, Michael? I, I remember I was brainwashed by Gene Weinberg. <laughs> <laughs> the the master Whoa. he's the one who gave me the... gold is for the mistress, silver for the maid, copper for the craftsman cunning at his trade. Wow. Good, said the Baron, sitting in his hall, but iron, cold iron, is ruler of them all. And we had all learned that <laughs> Kipling quote. That's funny. <laughs> I like that. I should hang that on my wall. Um, <laughs> so should. Pseudomonas has, has a number of different ways of getting iron, but from transferrin, it has a couple different ways. One, it makes a siderophore, which mm-hmm. is an iron-binding protein called pyoberic. Uh, you may want to explain the term. Uh, some of our listeners may not know it. Yep. So. Yep, siderophores are proteins that the bacteria make that can actually um, remove iron and, and take in iron and allow them to acquire iron from the environment. And and extracellular, so, right? The bacteria extracellular, yep. Them. So they secrete, yeah, sorry. So they secrete these proteins um, extracellularly to the environment. They can bind iron, and then the bacteria have specific receptors to take them back up into the bacteria and where they can then use the nutrient iron in the bacteria. And so um, Pseudomonas makes a couple different siderophores, but pyoverdin actually is a siderophore that Pseudomonas makes that's known to have a better affinity than transferrin or lactoferrin, other host binding, iron binding proteins. And so this is a tremendous siderophore that can actually pull the iron away from um, the host bi- iron binding proteins. Mm. Um, so can you make a, a Pseudomonas without the gene for this siderophore? Yes, you can. Are they viable? They are viable. If you put they them are viable. In- and so you give them iron. You have to give them iron, right? 
they need so they need iron. But so Pseudomonas actually has many different pathways for taking iron up. So if you mm. just get rid of one sidaerophore, they actually Pseudomonas also makes pyocalin. They make other sidaerophores, so it can still get iron. You have to knock out a lot of them to start um, by dysregulating iron homeostasis in Pseudomonas. I guess you're. I don't know if you're pursuing that or not, but you're content that it's iron that's having this effect, right? Um, we're content that iron is an important part of this phenotype, definitely. And um, we are also pursuing that. So we're looking at siderophores and some other mechanisms. Um, we've got transcriptomic studies and, and things going on right now to, to try to figure out exactly what Pseudomonas is doing with this nutri- different nutritional environment during the virus infection. So do you think the um, release of transferrin has, it's clearly dependent on interferon. Um, if you just treat cells with Interferon is is transferrin released bound to iron. Um, we've seen iron changes. We haven't looked at transferrin specifically yet. Right, because I'm wondering so if that's a good experiment. I'm just do. wondering if there's a virus effect because you were mentioning endocytosis and how it could be messed up by virus infection. Maybe that's part of the secretion effect. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we're cr- currently, after publishing this, we're trying to kind of tease apart some of the effects. What, Which is the host immune response and which are, uh, we do think there are some specific viral components to what's going on. And so we're trying to tease that apart right now in the lab. Yeah, it could be that the viral glycoprotein is part of it because that's getting endocytosis. And you can imagine that could make uh, alterations in trafficking of vesicles and sort of, that sort of thing, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you might want to look at pseudotypes with different glycoproteins of different viruses that might not be having That's the same effects, idea. you know, like mm-hmm. VSV comes to mind because people use that all the time. You can probably put the, the glycoprotein into, or you could make VSV pseudotyped with the respiratory syncytial virus glycoprotein and see if it has the same effect, if it, if it alters the trafficking. You want to say what a pseudotype is? A pseudotype is when you take a virus and you substitute uh, a glycoprotein from another virus. So a common one is vesicular stomatitis virus, which has a glycoprotein. Uh, in its membrane, you can insert the gene for a different viral glycoprotein like Ebola virus, and they're called pseudotypes, and then you can grow them in the lab and be safe about them because it's not Ebola virus. But in this mm-hmm. case, you could ask, is it just the respiratory syncytial glycoprotein that has this effect? That would be cool. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think those are pretty easy to make. Or at least that would allow us to tease apart the virus-specific effects from yeah. the actual innate immune effects. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm thinking here is what contribution the virus is making besides just triggering interferon, right? Mm Because it sounds like it's doing something to trafficking and you could sort that out. Yes. And sort is um, kind of a double-edged meaning, right? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Vincent. (laughs) I'm not that good. It just came. It just happened. (laughs) So the last um, experiment has to do with mice. Tell us about that. Yeah. So, um, so part of the reason we developed this whole biofilm assay was it's very hard to get chronic pseudomonas infections in, um, in small rodent models. And so um, some folks use an auger bead model where you put pseudomonas in the uh, actual auger beads and then instill those into the airway. But that I think has, is, str- is um, fraught with, other, with issues of um, the gene expression of pseudomonas doesn't necessarily correlate with what happens during a biofilm mode of growth. Um, you've also get some obstruction in those models occasionally. And so because we have to use this different pseudomonas model to grow the biofilms, we unfortunately can't use a rodent model for the co-infections, for the cro- these chronic infections. And so to get around that, we thought we could at least look at these differences in nutritional immunity during the virus infection. So you can do an RSV model um, and a neonatal mouse model. And so um, we collaborated with um, Carrie Empey at the pharmacy school here at Pittsburgh, and she has um, RSV neonatal mouse model where we could infect with virus and then watch watch in the bronchoalveolar lavage, so that's the fluid from the airways, over the period of a week and look and see, do we see changes in iron and do we see changes in transferrin, similar to what our in vitro models told us. Hmm. And so when we did that, we saw that um, over the course of a week that we do get a peak Iron is increased in the bronchoalveolar lavage fluid during RSV infection, and that actually correlates very nicely with an increase in transferrin abundance as well at the same time points. Mm -hmm. And so that suggested to us that potentially that during the virus infection in vivo, even we're seeing an increase in iron um, that that correlates with, uh, we then took that bronchoalveolar lavage fluid and similar to our condition media biofilm experiments, we added bacteria to it and saw that also induced biofilm growth. So that suggests that this nutrient might be able to stimulate biofilm growth in vivo. Has anybody looked in people with CF and looked to see if there's increased iron? 
So we're doing that right now. So we have a study, we initiated a study with an otolaryngologist at um, Pittsburgh. And so it's very hard to get bronchoalveolar lavage fluid or bron- they they are very rarely um, perform bronchoscopies in our adult CF mm. patient mm-hmm. population. And so to get around that, we collaborated with someone who studies bacterial and viral interactions in the sinuses. And so it's in cystic fibrosis, it's thought that a lot of these interactions that we study in the lungs, that we study in the models that I've been talking about, actually happen in the sinuses as well, in the upper respiratory tract. Mm. And so we recruited a patient population of CF patients and followed them um, for a year. So when the patients do not have virus infections, and then we caught some of them catching a virus infection. And when they did, we saw peaks in iron in there. Um, we use a sinonasal wash. So when our collaborator is in doing sinus surgery, she first does a gentle wash and take, collects the sinonasal epithelial um, fluid, similar to what we're calling the airway surface liquid in our assays. Mm-hmm. And so we do mm-hmm. see that correlates in patients very nicely. A lot easier than sinus. It's very exciting yeah. to see. Yes. And That's so. Great. Yeah, the reason for doing it in the sinus was, one, we're now looking to see, does this shift the microbial communities and change the microbiome when you have this nutrient change? Mm-hmm. But the reason it was so exciting with her, with to work with um, Stella Lee is the ENT that we work with. Um, when she does these studies, she actually debris patients, and then they spend about three months between their visits, and she has them do saline washes. And so our idea was, if we saw an increase in iron with virus infection, we would talk about putting, we're now about to submit a study to put iron chelators in those washes mm. and see can we change the um, the ability of, of pseudomonas to form chronic infections in these patients' airways, um, upper respiratory tract, if we put an iron chelation agent in during virus season, for instance. Mm-hmm. So that's Ooh, something that we're now cool. going to look at. Yeah. So, so do you think that affecting biofilm formation in the in the sinus, the upper tract, could influence what's going on in the lower tract? I mean, I guess so, I uh, the key- that's a really good question. And so the thought in the field is that there's adaptation in the microbial communities in the sinuses yeah. that precedes infection in the lung. And so the bacteria basically come into your upper respiratory tract. They sort of, they adapt and evolve there so that the strains that then make it to your lungs are more equipped to live in the host. And so mm-hmm. those are definitely questions. So we've just had a, a, a grant actually funded to study that exact question you just asked. So we're about to start recruiting patients to do that now. Because you can't put chelators down into the lung, right? So they are looking at um, at chelation therapy and cystic fibrosis. So they're mm-hmm. looking at nebulized therapies to um, mm-hmm. nebulize in an iron chelator. But those are in the early stages. And so we thought in the sinuses, we could, we could go after this question much sooner. And so um, that's why we're thinking yeah. of trying in the sinuses. So yeah. I want to ask you to speculate. Uh, many young parents are tortured by chronic ear infections during virus season. And they're thought to be triggered by a viral infection and then a biofilm sets down and the poor parent then, of course, is in daycare jail because the child has an ear infection and it's a a true ear infection. So do you think the same thing is going on with biofilms associated with cold and flu season in these young children where they're developing similar biofilms and could you get away with uh, simply a saline rinse with a chelator like you're thinking for in your CF patients? Yeah, so I think, yes, I think that is something we are certainly thinking about. And so um, the so we've done some studies in the paper using non-CF airway epithelial cells. And so we do think we see similar, um, we do see similar phenotypes in non-CF airway epithelial cells. So we don't think this is a cystic fibrosis specific thing. So that does suggest that this could be helping in other tissue systems. Um, Kevin Mason at Ohio State has done some really nice work looking at iron with viral bacterial interactions in otitis media. And so they think iron's important there too. So I do think potentially if we see some um, efficacy of of using these iron chelators, that might be a potential therapy in other diseases or other um, issues like otitis media as well. It's it's much better to think about using saline and a little EDTA or Chelex rather than an antimicrobial to treat uh, a poor child with uh, an ear infection. So it could be cool to see what would happen. Mm-hmm. They've also, so there's been some nice otitis media papers, and we showed using our model too, that actually when the virus infection precedes the biofilm, those biofilms are even more antibiotic resistant than oh, yeah. they were typically. And so um, 
even even the host induced or the host biofilms become even more antibiotic resistant and so during the virus infection and so i do think that's going to cause even further problems with antimicrobials so you're right i think thinking of other therapies like chel- iron chelations or, or things like that i think are going to be useful hopefully moving forward and one thing i want to correct is i went and made sure my neurons were working right the binding uh, or the uh, <laughs> constant for iron is 10 to the 20. It's not quite 10 to the 52. It's 10 to the 20. That's a big difference. It's still pretty amazing. Well, yeah. It's still pretty amazing. 10 to, 10 to the 20 is, yeah. 10 to the 20 molar is, is pretty impressive yeah. of how transferrin holds onto iron. Jennifer, Jen, you also mentioned using gallium along yes. with Kila. How would that work? So those are studies that are being done and actually are in the process of clinical th- of clinical trial right now, which is exciting. So Pradeep Singh out at University of Washington is doing those studies. And so the way gallium works is it actually is recognized and taken into the bacteria similar to iron. So it binds similar iron binding proteins. But then when it enters the bacterial cells, it can't be used in um, iron sulfur cluster enzymes, for instance, the way iron can. And so it actually dysregulates iron homeostasis and starves the bacteria of iron, even though they they think they're taking it up. And so um, it's a pretty sneaky way to, to target iron. Instead of chelator, chelators, you could do something like gallium to actually outcompete um, mm. the host seem, iron with gallium. I seem to remember we discussed this once. Yeah, in Twim, that's we? right. I was yes. just going to say there was a gallium story and how right. it would be very difficult to get resistance to gallium. That's another. That was another part of the study, yeah, which is also very exciting. Yeah. Yeah, that was a cool story. So this is a this is a lovely way to tease out the interaction between a specific bacterium and a virus or a couple of viruses. Are there other polymicrobial infections of this sort? Not necessarily CF, but maybe other things that people are working on, or is this pretty much limited to this? To viral bacterial, you yeah, mean? Or, yeah, vir- um, viral bacterial, yeah. Yeah, so folks are looking at viral bacterial interactions, particularly with influenza, so other respiratory tract, definitely. So they're looking at viral bacterial interactions um, with um, flu influenza and either Streptococcus pneumoniae or pneumonia or um, Staph aureus. Those are two common co-infections with flu. So that happens during the pandemic as well as just seasonal um, influenza infections, you'll get a good number of those patients actually, um, when they present and they're sick, they're actually sick with a bacterial pneumonia, which is often Staph aureus mm, mm. now with the um, pneumovax uh, vaccines. And then, um, so in terms of looking at viral bacterial interactions, um, Julie Pfeiffer is looking at them also in the gut. That's right. Um, yes. 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 Polio and bacteria in the microbiome and Mm-hmm. In that case, the bacteria are helping, helping. the viral infection. Yeah. So, Michael, remember we did a paper a long time ago on how influenza virus infection disrupts biofilms of, was it staph or? Influenza. Sh- it, it's it's strep, strep, strep pneumo. Right. And that gives and, you the. That, but it's that the wrong you- way around. Instead of it disrupts the, the strep pneumo biofilm, biofilm that's growing in the lung or growing on the epithelial layer. Uh, in the upper airway, and it effectively makes it planktonic. So right. the pneumococcus then sinks deep into the lung. And I was just trying to hunt which episode that was. That's where you get a bacteremia then after that. That's where right. you get a bacteremia. Yes. Yeah. So I, I'm, I, I was just wondering if, if iron is the trigger there as well. So I don't know that they've looked at it in strep pneumo co-infections. For Staph aureus, they have looked in um, lipocalin levels, which is a host antimicrobial antimicrobial protein as well as um, chelator. Um, lipocalin levels are actually changed during flu staph co-infections, and that that ends up with more free iron available to the bacteria. And so for flu staph, I think iron is going to be important. I don't think anyone, I'm not aware of any literature for flu strep pneumo co-infections. So what's uh, in the future in this, this area for your lab? Yeah. So for my lab, as I mentioned, we're about, we're gearing up to do this patient study to Mm -hmm. look at how viral infections shift both the microbial community as well as pseudomonas um, evolution in patients, which I'm very excited about. We're also 
as I said, looking, starting to try to tease apart what the contribution of it, how interferon is changing transferrin trafficking in the host cells. And so mm -hmm. uh, we're doing an interferon stimulated gene screen with John Scoggins using his ISG um, lentiviral system. Mm -hmm. So we're going to look and see which interferon stimulated genes cause this transcytosis. And since we're an epithelial cell biology lab, we're excited to then look and see how those proteins might be changing the trafficking of transferrin in our cells. Yep. So it, uh, we shouldn't let this go without pointing out a fabulous review article that you wrote with Jeff Melvin in PLOS Pathogens. It's listed under their uh, category pearls, and this mm -hmm. indeed is a pearl. It's called Compromised Defenses, Exploitations of Epithelial Responses During Viral Bacterial Co-Infection of the Respiratory Tract. It's a long title, but the paper is just fabulous. <laughs> Thank so you very I, much. I really salute you for it. I enjoyed every every word of it. Thank you. I concur. I hope you have that in the, in the show notes. I will. And, of course, PLOS Pathogens is open access, so everyone can reach it. And your paper might already be open after a certain number of months. Uh, becomes open in PNAS as well, which is always good for people to be able to check and out. Able to access, yes. Yep. This episode is brought to you by Curiosity Stream, the world's first ad-free nonfiction streaming service. They have over 1,500 titles and 600 hours of content. When you're finished listening to TWIM and TWIV and TWIP, etc., you can go to Curiosity Stream. It was founded by John Hendricks, who used to be with Discovery Channel. So you know right away you're going to get real science. You can watch this on the web through your browser or on any of those devices that interface the Internet with your TV, like the Apple TV, the Roku, and many others, available in 196 countries. And what they have is a wide variety of science and technology documentary-type shows. They also have interviews, lectures, and... Um, a variety of all sciencey stuff that I think listeners of uh, the microbe TV shows would really like. Some cool examples, Digits, a three-part series hosted by Derek Mueller, who created the YouTube science channel Veritasium. This explores online safety and security. And two of the recent guests have been Edward Snowden and Vint Cerf. Stephen Hawking's Favorite Places is a cool series. He pilots computer-generated spaceship across the universe, and he stops at his favorite places. And this always brings up, what is your favorite place to go to in the universe? Deep Time History is a three-parter on the 14-billion-year history of the universe. And there are many, many more. If you just go there, curiositystream.com, and search. You don't have to sign in just to do a search. You can see all the cool stuff. Search for science. Search for virus. You'll even find some virus shows, bacteria, microbes. They also have a interesting library of Super high-definition content, the so-called 4K films or movies. No more film these days, right? Over 50 hours of 4K. And there are monthly and annual plans. They start at $2.99 a month, less than a cup of coffee. So it's highly affordable, and I think you'll like it. Check it out. Check out curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the promo code microbe during sign-up to get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series. That's completely free for the first 60 days. Two months, two entire months free of one of the largest nonfiction 4K libraries around. Just go to curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the offer code microbe at sign up. We thank Curiosity Stream for their support of TWIM. I wanted to read two emails. We get lots of email to uh, TWIM, as you probably know, Jen. Mm -hmm. There are two here I wanted to read. First is from Tom for the article about microbial batteries which we did a while ago on TWIM, I think CV refers to capacitance times voltage, which is stored charge. In electronics, current is abbreviated I, not C. All right, thank you for that, Tom. CV, I think, uh, since I wasn't with that TWIM, CV si stands for cyclic voltometry. Is that right? Yeah, what, or cyclic voltometry. Not capacitance times voltage? Which is no, it's, it's, uh, if, <laughs> no, if I'm remembering the paper right, it, it's probably measuring cyclic photometry. Okay. Uh, Tom continues, the claim in the letter got me thinking about microbial batteries, and I wrote a blog post about their theoretical capacity. They have potential. He sends a link to that in uh, Medium. It's called Mr. Microbe Needs a Jolt. And he writes, this week in microbiology, <laughs> had a letter reader letter about bio batteries that referenced a CV metric. And he goes through a number of calculations about how much current you could get out of this. 
So to, I'll put this in the show notes and you can check it out. Thank you for that, Tom. And then we have one from Nancy who writes, Hello, Twim team. Since discovering you all, I have been binge listening to Twip and Twim. Most, uh. most enjoyable to listen to the discussions and very good leavening for the mind. Huh. <laughs> the point I wish to make seems so blindingly obvious that I hesitated to write to you about protecting patients from infections in the hospital. All this hand sanitizing and all, all of its cleaning goes on, but where is the attention paid to the patient's hands? There is no hand sanitizer offered before meals or on hand by the patient's beds. I have not seen this visiting my local hospital as patient or visitor. Maybe I am completely wrong and this protocol is in place, but if not, this is a big missing component. Thanks for the hours and hours of fascinating knowledge. But Michael, you might know about hand sanitizer in hospitals. On I I don't think we give them any hand sanitizer with the delivery of the meals. I, I I'll have to ask my friends in infection control what their policy is on that. And if they don't, is that a problem, right? Well, we tell our young children to wash their hands before eating. We do it before eating. So <laughs> the question is, why wouldn't patients? Yeah. And they're sort of stuck in bed. Entity. <laughs> well, you know, people come to visit, they shake the patient's hands and they may give them microbes, right? And they're compromised there. So. And then they go and wash their hands subsequent yeah. to uh, touching the patient when they go then to examine them. So yeah. it's well interesting. Ask your friends. and we'll, I will we'll, ask my uh, friends in infection control and see what they have to say. Boy, I don't have any friends in infection control. You're a lucky guy. I am a lucky guy. <laughs> okay. Well, our fearless leader, Vincent, has been interviewed and is the subject of a piece in a blog site called Associations Now, which deals with why associations should have podcasts. And guess what? The paradigm example of a podcast is what you hear here as well as in TWIV and in This Week in Parasitism. Vincent explains very well how it should be done, what works and what doesn't, and he gets a lot of kudos for it. Thank you. Yeah, he did, a, he did a good job on that article. It was uh, He starts out by saying, Vincent Racaniello loves microbes. <laughs> hey, ain't that the truth? <laughs> Even when I'm infected with them, which is all the time. As much as you love them. Yeah, right. <laughs> Well, and the article also points out that our fans actually named one of their pets after Vincent and one of his other co-hosts. That's right. So, Someone sent which, us a picture of their dogs that named them Vincent and Dixon. How about Dixon that? Vincent and Dixon. Yeah, that's, that's dedication. And we'll put yes. a link to that article in the show notes. Right. I also want to tell you about the sponsor of this episode, Drobo. This is a family of safe and expandable storage arrays. And they have a special holiday deal I want to tell you about. But first, what is Drobo? It's a storage system for your data on your computer. Now, if you know someone who, who has more data that fits on a hard drive, if you're dealing with clutter due to multiple drives, you need a simple system for your photos, your music, your videos, your other data. If you answered yes to any of those, you need a Drobo. It's built on the simple idea that to increase storage capacity, you just have to add a hard drive, to its units or a bigger hard drive. They're rectangular black units with slots for hard drives in them. They go from five to eight to 12 different slots. And it uses a technology called Beyond RAID. So if you take a five slotter, you put five drives into it, they all look like one on your computer and they're all merged together. Now, as you fill up this array, this Beyond RAID, if it gets full, you can just pull out a drive and put a bigger one in. And, you know, drives are getting bigger and bigger. So you can keep increasing the capacity for a while, especially if you have a 12 slot one, which I covet, by the way. And if a drive fails, you just pull it out and put a new one in. Your data is restored because it's redundant across this beyond RAID. It's very cool technology. Now, this may sound complicated, but it's really very simple because the, the Drobo on the front has a series of lights, one next to each hard drive. It's beautiful, actually. When they're all green, means everything is okay. When one of them turns yellow, it means it's getting full. And then you just... Pull it out and put a new one in. It's as simple as that. Very simple. Now, if, if the light turns red, it means it's full or ready, so you have to replace it. If it's flashing red, the, the drive is defective. You need to replace it as well. But in all cases, you don't lead your, lose your data. So you have data protected, and you can keep increasing the capacity. They have a number of different units. As I've told you, they have a 5, an 8, or a 12 
bay unit. They even have a five drive unit that you can put on your network so you can access your files throughout your house, or you could access them from anywhere in the world. And there are apps that you can use to put these Drobos in the cloud. It's really, really cool stuff and very affordable too, especially with their holiday special. Now through December 31st, Drobo is offering the listeners of all the Twix podcasts, which includes Twim, of course, the best deal of the year. You can save 20% or more. That's 100 to 800 bucks off the purchase of a Drobo 5N, which is their network attached system, or a 5D, a 5DT, which are Thunderbolt and USB 3, or any 8 or 12 bay unit system. To take advantage of this, it's an incredible deal. Go to drobostore.com and enter the code microbe20 at checkout. I think this is a great deal, 20%. I'm going to do it. I can't get the 12 bay. It's too expensive, but I need more. I need more storage. We thank Drobo for their support of TWIM. All right. That will be it for TWIM 141. You can find it at iTunes and also microbe.tv slash TWIM. And consider becoming a patron of TWIM and all the other shows. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. We have a number of ways that you can help us out, including Patreon and other modalities. And it helps us to do a little bit of traveling. So next time I go to Hamilton, Montana, I could take one of my co-hosts with me, for example, that sort of thing. And of course, always love getting your questions and comments. Send them to twim at microbe.tv. Our guest today has been Jennifer Baumberger from the University of Pittsburgh. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was a pleasure to be here, and um, it was a great opportunity. So thanks for inviting me. Lovely work. Good luck, and uh, good thank luck you. with tenure. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> Elio Schechter is at Small Things Considered. Thank you, Elio. My pleasure, of course. Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Chris Kandayan and Ray Ortega for their technical help. I also want to thank the sponsors of this episode, Curiosity Stream and Drobo. The music you hear on TWIM is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. Microbiology.